Welcome to our weekly hangout on the economy. I'm Trudy Makaya, resident economic analyst here at NCNCA. Today we're going to be talking about a subject that keeps a lot of us awake at night, the fate of our matriculants as they go into the economy. Now at this time of the year, we get metric results, it's all excitement, we interrogate them, we scrutinize them, and then the conversation moves on very swiftly to issues in tertiary institutions. But the fact of the matter is that most of the metropolitans are actually not going to be going into further or higher education, but they're going to be going directly into the economy. So what happens to, to these young people as they try to find work, or even in rare instances, as they try to set up their own businesses? Today we've assembled a panel um, of people who thought about this issue, people who lived this issue, who researched it, and who also tried to find solutions to it. We have Dr. Neil Rankin, a microeconomist from Stellenbosch, who studies transitions from work um, to the labor market and also the demand for new skills. We also have Zaman Zorubu who will be joining us as we go on. She's the MD of Youth Lab, um, a platform think tank uh, policy forum which looks at youth issues, and she's also a communicator for the National Planning Commission. We have Jackie Williams who is the Chief Operating Officer of Harambe Youth Employment Accelerator. And with her, we have Maleba Mashiko, who is a candidate for Harambe. And will tell us more about Harambe, uh, which is a not-for-profit company that has placed over 10,000 young people into, um, corporate, into big organizations across South Africa. Now, I think we'll start with the basics, like the elephant in the room. What happened to the metric certificate? There was a time when it was considered um, the pathway to a decent working life. It was a transition into the economy. And then suddenly one gets this notion that it's not um, worth the paper it's written on, et cetera, and that um, it, 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 it no longer has the same status it, it used to have. Is this the correct perception? Um, if so, what happened? If not, um, what is this myth about it and what are the actual facts? Um, Neil, um, let, let's start with you as a microeconomist who thought about this. What is the value of the metric? So I think what's happened and why the perception is that it's not as valuable as it was is that the um, amount of people writing and passing metric has, has increased much faster than the types of jobs or the amount of jobs available. So now you need to be more and more qualified to get the types of jobs you used to be able to get without a metric. But that's not to say that uh, the matric certificate is not valuable. In fact, it's incredibly valuable. Um, because what it does is it gets you into the pool of job uh, applicants. So it's like buying a lottery ticket. You know, you can't win the lottery if you don't have a ticket. Well, you, 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 know, you just about can't get a job in South Africa if you don't have a, a matric certificate. So what that does is it gets you on the table. And, and you see that you know, when you look at the data, the probability of being employed jumps dramatically for those who get a matric certificate. Thanks, Neil. Uh, let me get to you, um, Jackie. I mean, your experience with working with young people um, who have just emerged from um, a matric certificate, do you get the sense that it's um, adequate preparation for, for working life? Um, you know, in the Harambe world, we've had a very different experience because what we found is that through working very closely with businesses, um, a lot of employers don't actually value the matric certificate. And what they've done is they've put in place a lot of psychometric testing to try and um, understand what a person's competency is rather than relying on the matric certificate as a measure for whether that person will succeed in their business. Um, so what we've encountered, um, we've partnered with over 100 employers now, um, is that the businesses have instituted psychometric testing and they often use literacy and numeracy as proxies for whether the person um, is somebody that they should interview or not. Um, right, you know, varying right across all the industries, so right from if you want to go work in a retailer in South Africa, even though you have a matric certificate, you still have to pass a literacy test or a numeracy test. And we're finding um, in the Harambe world that a lot of matriculants, even though they've done 
numeracy or uh, math literacy um, at a matric level, they often fail the numeracy and the literacy tests that the employers put in their, in, you know, in their interview and in their selection process. So what we're finding in some ways is that the businesses don't have faith in the matric certificate in terms of what people's capabilities are um, and that the basic skills that they think are required for the job um, and they try and test for young people can't pass even with a matric certificate. So what we've done at Arambia is we've tried to influence businesses around their testing practices because we know that the numeracy and literacy rates in South Africa are quite poor we've instituted a test called learning potential and what that measures really is the matriculant's ability to learn new material and to apply, apply it in the workplace rather than testing literacy or numeracy and trying to give businesses a different proxy um, for success in the business world. So even though a person might not pass a numeracy test, they do well um, potentially on our learning potential test and we know that they have the ability to learn in the work environment. The matric certificate in South Africa has become, um, I think, something that, in our experience, businesses don't trust, but you have to have a matric often to apply for the job. But then people apply for the job with the matric, and if they don't have work experience, or they don't pass the psychometric assessments, they still don't interview. So that's been our experience, um, Hadarambi, and, you know, it's really difficult. I mean, maybe Maleba can actually add to this conversation, because she herself has a matric certificate and job searched for a couple of years. Yes, um, I've been unemployed for a few years now, and and every time that I apply for a job, I've only been to two interviews. And within those two interviews, they constantly want job, job experiences. So with not having a job experience, you really can't get a job anyway. So Harambe does help a lot in that aspect of it giving you those that, that attitude that's needed whenever you're searching for a job. Okay, I think that, that's a very interesting point because the, the consensus seems to be that you actually need the certificate, the paper to, to, to be a player, to be considered a player in it, but then there's more um, that's required that other institutions have to fill in. I mean, if we look at the unemployment rate for the youth, I mean, it's over a third of young people who are sitting in unemployment, and this is for all youth, including those with a higher education. Probably if you drill down to look at those with only a metric, you find that the rate is, is much higher. Other than this, you know, catch-22 situation of work experience, um, not having work experience, but obviously needing it to get that first job. Neil, what do you think are the other barriers to um, youth uh, employment in this economy? Well, I think there's a, there's a lot of things. I mean, obviously, you know, this uh, not having uh, work experience, but I think that also speaks to this issue that the matric certificate doesn't tell you how well you will fit with a job. And so, you know, what employers uh, are looking for are signals of how well you would fit with the job. And that's what the work experience does, and that's what other types of tests do that tell you, well, uh, that someone has learning potential or something like that. So, you know, the challenge, obviously, for young people is to try and get those types of signals. Um, so that's the one issue. The other issue is, obviously, you know, where the jobs are and where young people can live and, and can afford to live. Uh, you know, we have these spatial issues, uh, you know, the transport, it's very expensive to go out and look for jobs. Uh, but we also have this issue of networks. And, you know, most job uh, referrals come through these networks. And if you aren't connected into the labor market through someone else in your household who works or, or through knowing people who work, it's very, very difficult to actually get yourself into even an, uh, you know the application, and I think that's that's one of the big challenges, and, and uh, you know one of the challenges that, that places like Arambia are trying to deal with is like how do you get people who have nobody else in the household working? How how do you get those types of people actually into the the first stage, the application stage? How do you tell them about jobs? How do you let those people actually know and take part uh, so they don't stumble before the first hurdle. Okay. You know, as you say, they shouldn't stumble before the first hurdle. And I think these network issues are very important. Um, getting back to you, Maleba, I mean, from what Neil has just said about um, spatial issues but also networks, I mean, what was your experience in, in that sense? Did you find that 
for instance, I think Harambe research has shown that sometimes people have to move to, 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 to find jobs. Um, how did you deal with some of those kinds of challenges in, in your job search? And how did you find Harambe, for instance? Um, I did have uh, challenges in finding a job because you find that some jobs where you might have network are not based in your province, so you might have to move. So if you don't have a network like I don't, my, my brother only works in a factory, so I don't have much network. So not having network becomes harder for you to actually find the job and get into the market. However, Harambe teaches me, Harambe, within Harambe, getting to Harambe, I created my own network with other people, the people that I was in with. So that becomes my own network. And with that network, I can actually prosper in the in wherever I go and in all the environments that I am exposed to. No, can so I? Can I, I just want to add. Okay, so in the Harambe world, what we've tried to do over the last three years that we've been in existence is to try and help young work seekers who haven't had a lot of work experience, so less than a year's formal work experience. Um, come through an assessment process and then we've done a bridging program for young people to make them more work ready for the world of work. Um, the bridging program that we've created is more like a simulated work experience. So young people come into our environment, um, we have a sense of which sectors they'll be more suited to based on all the assessment tests that they write with us. And then the bridging curriculum is designed like a work experience. Um, and young people are taught to manage themselves, they have a scorecard, they have to participate, they have to work for all the work opportunities um, that, are, that we have. And then what Harambe's done and worked very hard at is to partner with a whole lot of organisations that will take young people from us into entry level work, even though they don't have work experience. But they've had a bridging programme through Harambe. Um, and we're finding that it's translating into a lot of success. So in essence, Harambe holds the network with the employers and a lot of the young people who come to us because of where they live, their geography, the level of poverty in their family and the level of unemployment for a lot of young people in their own households find their way to Harambe and then we create the network for them. So after they've completed a bridging program, for example, we would then assist them and bring in employers to interview the young people that would then put them into work. Um, so in essence, um, you know, even though the matriculant has a matric certificate, they come through our assessment battery, we've guided them in terms of what we think work would be more suitable to their interests and to their abilities. Then we take them through a bridging program and then all the young people that we've sourced are based on demand that we've secured up front. So Harambe goes out and looks for where all the available jobs are, all the entry level work in the um, economy. Um, and then we bring in young people to try and fill those positions because we know that they can't find work by themselves. Um, some of the barriers uh, for young people in South Africa to work see, um, of, uh, you know, obviously poverty plays a, a big role. So taxi fare to go and job search, time at an internet cafe when you don't own a computer. If you do internet in South Africa is very expensive, so you can't job search in the way that most people do. Um, and then I think sometimes there's also a lot of misunderstanding about the economy in South Africa and where entry level work is for matriculants. So matriculants have an expectation of where they think they should work or they've had some counselling from a teacher at school and often there's a big mismatch between what jobs are available um, to the young person in their geography and what jobs they're looking for. Um, so Harambe's had to do a lot of work around what we call career advocacy is to also help young people. So the misperception in some ways is also a big barrier in terms of how people job search and what they job search for and what their expectations are of work, um, as well as the transport issues. So, um, you know, Neil alluded to it, but geography in South Africa and spatial issues are a huge issue in South Africa, not just in terms of getting work, but then also in terms of sustaining work. So on an entry level salary, if you're paying more than a third of your salary towards taxi or transport, you can't sustain the job. The so people then fall out of the job back into unemployment as well because they've got to pay so much for transport. So transport, a lot of access. I mean, I also want to pause at this stage to ob obviously to emphasize that when we're talking about networks here, we're talking about benign, innocent, ways of bringing employers and potential workers together. 
because there's also often talk about or perceptions of um, insider networks and nepotism and that sort of thing. That's not what we're talking about. Here we're basically talking about the, the basic information that's required um, to get people together. I mean, Neil, I don't know if you've got a, a reflection on that. Is it that a lot of people do find uh, problems of being outsiders for other reasons that would have to do with um, corruption or, um, I don't know, social marginalization? Neil, are you picking Neil? this up? <laughs> okay, we'll get back to Neil on that. Uh, okay. Zama has joined us. Zama, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me? Okay. I can okay. hear you perfect. Thank Great. you for this. Um, of course, you, um, you know, you've had you know, multiple experiences across the economy as MD of Youth Lab. You're also, of course, involved as a, as a communicator for the National Planning Commission, but I think uh, you're not speaking for them necessarily um, in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Just this big issue of youth unemployment. I know your organization tries to bring youth voices um, into the forefront in, in policy debate. Is the youth voice being heard on this issue? Um, I would say at policy level, definitely not enough. Um, you, you, it's kind of secondary voice. You know, there are a lot of organizations that are doing great work that. Um, end up, I suppose, from from their position, speaking for young people um, on 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 their experiences. I mean, these are valid voices. These are people who experience almost objectively the concerns of young people and the concerns of employers. But there is definitely a need uh, for for more spaces that have direct voices um, from, from, from young people, especially now given that the youth um, policy is out and, and feedback is being requested in the next month or so. I think um, feedback, um, the, the, the closing for, for, for that process is the end of, of February. But even then, these are very small windows of opportunities for young people to say something directly. More often than not, it's other people speaking on behalf of young people. And what are the key issues that you, you think are missing from, from this debate, from your perspective and, and your engagement? Because we've talked about more like objective barriers um, to, to finding employment, like transport, like the cost of um, searching for work. But are we missing something? Are there other social, perhaps cultural issues um, that are being uh, left off the table in this discussion? It's, it's a myriad of issues that fall under the banner of structural. So um, give you an example. I, I was speaking to some young people who have just graduated, and they were talking about how they can't take internships because the, the amount they get for an internship is it covers or barely covers transport. So if something happens that's an unforeseeable expense outside of transport, that young person will not have enough money at the end of the month just for transport. And they don't have... Um, family that they can ask for, 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 for money. I have, I have that situation also actually at work, so I, I really understand it. And when you speak to, to, to employers, employers will tell you that basically employers feel as though young people are, are, are acting out or being entitled by, by, by saying this, as if they're not grateful. But there is, diff because of our structural issues, there is such a big gap between the understanding of employers of what the experience, the real lived experience of a young person in a household is um, around the access to resources, who they can ask, versus what the employer understands life to be in South Africa. Because that employer has a child that can do an internship unpaid because he or she can give that child money for transport. And, and so, it's structurally the big issues that translate into very, very different lived experiences, which translate into sometimes interventions that we think are well-meaning, but actually exacerbate the, the inequalities, because then kids from privileged backgrounds are able to take up internships, and the kids who really need the internship can't. Yeah. And countries like America, they don't have the same study challenges with poverty, that internships are a luxury uh, for fairly Ivy League um, graduates to, to access jobs um, that are not available to people who have to earn a living from day one um, and, and who have to contribute to a household, etc. Neil, I want to get back to you on, on this very issue in the sense that you get a sense that all of these costs 
um, that to get the young person to the workplace that have to be met. And one obvious response would be to say, well, government should meet those costs. Um, government should subsidize and incentivize um, employers to hire young people, especially those with um, straight from, from the trick. And the question is, well, I think you know the debate. Should we be paying employers um, to meet some of, to, to be creating jobs and to be meeting some of these basic costs? Well, government is subsidizing them. I mean, with their employment tax incentive, uh, that's aimed uh, at this group. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, employers get tax back or, or a tax credit if they hire, if it's a new hire and they hire uh, younger people between 18 and, and 20 and 30 and at the sort of lower end of the earnings uh, or the wage uh, uh, distribution so those are, are mostly sort of new jobs entry-level jobs so so government is is trying that I mean I think you know the first best solution is obviously to grow the job pool and to grow labor demand and you know we, we spend all this time talking about supply side issues and yes I mean they're they're important but you know without a growing pool or growing demand for young people you know, these these kind of interventions are almost our second best. So I think, you know, governments should, well, I don't want to say should rather, but a, a, a core uh, role for government must be thinking about how do we grow labor demand. Um, and then, yeah, to, to kind of address some of these, these market failures, that they're, they're trying with this uh, employment tax incentive. You know, it's still early days. Very many companies don't know about it. Um, the, the numbers I've seen coming out of Treasury seem to suggest that it's working quite well, but we won't really know until until uh, some formal uh, uh, investigation has been done. Okay. Um, and on that, Jackie, I mean, interact with, um, in terms of placing young people um, that, that you obviously um, have relationships with, is this is the employment tax incentive something that comes up in conversation that they're excited about, aware of, um, or is it something that um, it still has to make its mark? Look, I mean, we, we've tried to facilitate some conversations uh, between Treasury and employers around the tax incentive. Um, I think, it's, I think it's been really useful uh, in terms of Harambee's world because we focus on youth um, for companies to have uh, motiv motivation to hire youth particularly. Um, but I also think it, it's, I mean, what we've also tried to do is to influence employers around what the issues are for young people when they get their first job and um, to break down some of the basic barriers. Um, for example, you know, if we can influence how the young person is paid, for example, in the first month of work, um, it's really beneficial. So if they can get paid potentially weekly for the first two weeks and then maybe every two weeks and then monthly, for example, that tries to create a buffer for transport. Um, so we've tried to really, when there's been poor attention often with our employers, we really try and give them a sense of what the difficulties have been for young people to stay employed um, and for the employers to try and take up the onus on trying to solve some of those issues. Um, and then the other thing we've also tried to do is to prepare young people for what the what the requirements would be. So, for example, if an employer is only going to pay you in six weeks, you know, from the stipends that they get at Arambi or potentially from other areas, we try and help them problem solve and plan for the transport and budget so that they know that they can get over the first hurdle. Um, I know that's not always possible. If we do find from the research that we've done, about 40% of the young people borrow money and then pay it back. Um, but the, the sad thing is that some people borrow from loan sharks and that, even in their first month of work, and then get into debt because of the high interest rates, um, you know, just to cover transport to get to work. So, you know, my sense is employers also need to be, as much as they get the tax incentive, try to rethink about how they remunerate people that first come on to work. And within our own organization, we've employed over 100 people, but often we stagger it so they get weekly pay, then every two weeks they get paid, and then they would go on to monthly pay um, to try and close some of that gap around the issue, you know, the practical costs of coming to work are for the young person. Um, but, yeah, I mean, employers need to, I think, do more, actually. And I think that the benefits um, is that it does improve their retention in the long run. True. 
And I suppose because, you know, it's also been shown that once someone has been employed, um, they get that first job, chances are they'll stay in, in that job for a long time, but it's more about ensuring that they, you know, they stay beyond a year in, in, in that first job. Sure. And that also for employers, you know, retention is not just about your internal issues um, in terms of an organization and how you keep young people engaged in work, but it's also about the external social circumstances and understanding what the real barriers are. And I think um, what Summer was alluding to is that there really is a big misunderstanding between people who are employed, who are insiders in the economy, and people who are outside the economy. And that people don't really understand, once you're inside the economy, how hard it is to get into the economy and then to stay in the economy when you come from a place that doesn't support that. You know, whether it's, you know, in terms of income, household income or social issues or health issues or whatever it is that you have to manage um, in terms of staying employed. Um, so at Arambi, we've tried to generate a lot of research. Um, so we've had over about 150,000 young people apply. Um, and we've tried to understand what the barriers are for job seekers in, in South Africa and then to try and create mechanisms where it's cheap for them to apply, it's easy for them to apply and then when they get into work, our big motivation is to keep them in formal employment for at least a year. Um, so to build a process that helps to sustain them, helps them to plan, helps them to budget, helps them to understand what the world of work requires for them to stay employed. And I suppose there's something that we often say um, quite flippantly um, that, you know, we, we there's so much effort placed towards um, encouraging people to become um, employees and not um, enough in terms of encouraging young people um, to create jobs and, and become business owners. So I want to check, change tech a little here, um, maybe uh, starting with you, Zama. Just thinking about that proposition, um, how likely is it for young people coming straight out of metric to start their own businesses? Those who try, what are their experiences? Um, is this a reasonable thing to be saying about young people that they should be um, trying to create jobs themselves? Um, we know from research that um, people who start businesses um, because of a need to, 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 to get an income uh, subsistence um, far more likely to fail than people who start a business because they have a good good idea um, because they 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 really are passionate about business. We also know that people who have had experience um, in in working in a small to medium sized business are more likely to 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 do well when they start their own business. And so that requires that means young people who start businesses should have had a job first. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of statistics that tell us that starting a business is not, is not simply, something, simply an issue of get seed funding and do something. We also know that structurally South Africa does not support um, businesses, um, small businesses. We know that we, 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 we have a high failure rate. We have a small concentration of of um, um, businesses that support other businesses, so there's there's there's, there's quite a lot of um, it's quite competitive um, in, in in that small medium sized uh, market. And given that it's 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 a very tall ask of anybody, never mind a young person who's coming out of 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 school. And so we have to ask ourselves. Um, how realistic the expectation that 90% of jobs will come from small, medium-sized businesses, many of which will be started by young people who don't have work experience. We must actually really start to, to um, explore the complexity of that transition between, between school and, and the workplace um, as part of the transition to, to, to workplace, to, to self-employment, and maybe even becoming an employer. So yeah, it is. I, I hear that a lot. I, I'm. I also work at the planning commission, and it's it's one of the things that's that's in the plan that I, I sometimes even um, challenge my boss about. We need to be a little clearer clearer about about the expectation and realistic to 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 our economy. And it is more likely that we should. I feel personally that we should actually explore more of an option of one looking at people who are working. Who have the management experience, the financial experience, um, the experience of, of writing business cases and, 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 and testing out um, um, products and innovation 
encourage those people to, to, to be less risk averse and look at our financial institutions and the expectations, the things around uh, bankruptcy laws, etc. That encourage those people who are actually uh, much more likely to start a, a successful business, um, to, 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 to start businesses. It, we, we have to do an evidence-based kind of approach towards um, entrepreneurship and to put such a heavy expectation on young people um, to when we are struggling, we struggle with, one, with young people when they start working in a very protected environment in big corporates. How about putting a young person to be a business owner on their own? It's, it's such an unfair expectation. So we need to relook at that. Okay, so unfair expectation, um, almost pushing young people into what will end up being survivalist businesses. Neil, your thoughts on that? Is that um, a, quite a you know a fair way of um, looking at this issue around youth entrepreneurship? Yeah, so I think Zama is you know 100% correct there, and I think you know what what apartheid did is it you know excluded a whole portion of the population from getting that work experience that. You know, when they when they hit their mid thirties or, or early forties, they can actually go out and start their their own business. And you know, as as a a new cohort of, of black uh, you know uh, work or people come through and 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 you know build up skills and 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 connections and and uh, expertise, we should see you know more entrepreneurship happening uh, because we've broadened the pool. And yeah, it's a, it is a very unrealistic expectation to say to young people, uh, um, you know, start your own business. Even the people we have in our mind who've been sort of successful, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurs. You think about, you know, the in, in the South African context, for example, Mark Shuttleworth, or in the international context, you think about Bill Gates and and, and Zuckerberg and those guys. I mean, they all came from middle class uh, uh, families where their families could support them. So again, we we're dealing with these societal challenges, where uh, you know, like uh, uh, Jackie mentioned, you know, young people can't survive in their parents' garage working on some concept without any pay because you know there's no other stream of income. So it's a it's a very difficult challenge, and I, I think yeah, we do get swept away with this idea that you know entre entrepreneurship will solve all our problems, but uh, you know it's it's actually a much much more complex process than that. Okay, I'd love to hear Maleva's view on this. I mean, Maleva, when you look at your peer group, when you look at um, you know young people in your circle, um, do you find that perhaps somewhere down the line, um, working for yourself will be an option or or is it that you focus more on getting rooted in the workplace now and getting that first opportunity? I believe that starting your own company with that the experience that's required, it won't succeed. That business will not grow to be what it should be. So hence, that's why I believe that you need to get that experience first before you can actually start your own company. So without the experience, your company is not going to succeed much. You can't start a business when you don't know where you're going to get your finance from. So now you can start the business now, but then two months down the line, with no income, visible income that you can actually work on, your business is not going to succeed. So that's why I believe that when you start a business, you need to have some form of business experience behind you in order for that business to be successful in the future. Okay. I think there's, there's agreement there that you, you, know, you, you need to start um, somewhere uh, before you, you can think of um, going on your own. Now, um, just to think about then, you know, we've you know we've talked about the issues, but in terms of just practical advice, um, in terms of the channels that young people use to, to, to look for work, you know, um, some say people are over reliant on the media, whereas the kinds of jobs they should be looking for are not necessarily in the media. People are too reliant on corporates, whereas perhaps they should be looking at small businesses in their neighborhoods. What practical advice comes from the research, the insight that you have in terms of if you had to give a young person a job search or you, yeah, a job search strategy um, in this very tough environment, uh, what would you say? Maybe let me start with you, Zama. It's, it's a tough one. Um, I, for, for graduates, I would, I would say um, start working at varsity or at, at, at your um, um, 
higher education institution. It's, it's very important because people start looking for particular skills. So focus on the skill first. What, what are you getting out of that? Um, as, as, as an employer myself, as somebody who, who, who looks at CVs and employs people, I, I often look at graduate level at what you were doing other than studying. Um, it's an important one for me to ask because that's, that's how I gauge a level of commitment. Are you able to commit to something for a long time? Um, are you able to kind of set goals for yourself? Are you able to manage pieces of work? That demonstration is important. If you're coming straight from, from high school, um, which, is, which is much more difficult and you have a matric, um, also try, try to, to get involved in, 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 in things at school that are other, other than your ac academics. Don't, don't slip on your academics, they're important. But try to do other things that demonstrate a, a, a bit of leadership, etc. Then when you start looking, yes, do not, do not focus solely on the, on the corporates. Um, look at NGOs. Um, um, Nonprofits are, are great employers, actually. They might not have great packages, but they're great employers because they're small. Um, they need people to do different types of things. So, so you, you get a, a great range of skills and you get great exposure from, from, from nonprofits. Um, SMEs, if you can, um, I know that SMEs are very shy to hire young people because. Um, for, um, an employer at a small and medium-sized business has a lot more to lose from you if you don't behave, right? You, they, there's a, a bad employee in a small company can think a company. So it's, it's tougher there. You, you have to demonstrate um, yourself a lot more. But, but the, it is worth trying in those spaces because the, the reward, again, is exposure to, to a broad set of, of skills and they're great transferable skills that you can get there. Okay. Neil, any thoughts from, from your perspective and from your research? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the first thing is get your metric um, because that gets you on the table. And, yeah, I think Zama's got a, a lot of good suggestions there. Uh, my, my other suggestion would be to think about getting yourself into networks that would lead or, or, or give you contacts in the, the, the working world. So that may be, uh, you know, volunteering, it might be, uh, you know, church networks, it could be NGOs, um, or, you know, those types of things that are networks beyond your immediate social circle. Because a lot of the, the, the job referrals come through these kind of soft networks, which is not your immediate circle, but those beyond. So, so you know, try and, try and break into those, you know, the clubs you do at school or the, the extramurals you partake in. Uh, because that at least you know gives you a broader uh, group of people you can call upon in your job search. Maleba, were these things you were thinking about when you were in high school? Not even close. So you don't think of volunteering when you're still in high school because you're still growing up. You're still into a circle of your peers, just trying to have fun while you're still in high school. So if we had known that when you're in high school you need to volunteer or you need to start acquiring some form of skills, then I would have done that. But when you're in high school, you don't even think of actually going out there and volunteering. So all these things should have been known while we were still in high school. Maybe things would be different right now. And Julie, I'd like to add to that because my sense is I think young people live in the moment. They're not necessarily planning for the future, so the way young people think just develop mentally in some ways that they, you know, that they have a bright, wide, open future in South Africa, and that when they just finish with trick, they just focus on that. That then there'll be opportunities, and a lot of young people are taught to believe that. Um, and then my sense is that there's a lot of disappointment that seeps in afterwards because the job searching process is so painful and so hard and so alienating um, for a lot of young South Africans, which is a lot of the anger and a lot of what we see in the press around young people is the frustration, I think, of wanting to be participating. Because there's a lot of uh, myths about young people that they don't want to work. I mean, our experience at Arambi has been that young people really, 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 really want the opportunities, but they're not given them. Um, so it's really hard, you know, in terms of uh, how people give up and they become despondent work seekers. Um, but I also, I just want to add um, to what Zama and Neil were saying, because I agree with everything they say. Um, I think what young people have to engage with is that they need to think about trying to find opportunities that give them any form of work experience, even if it's for one day, 
So to not devalue some kinds of work experience and overvalue other kinds of work experience because every opportunity to work is an opportunity to learn about how to function at work, whether it's a good experience or a bad experience or whether you're working in pick and pay or in Nando's or you're working at Burger King or you're working at Standard Bank. Um, you know, the experiences in some way should all be valued because every experience at work gives you work experience, um, which, like Sama said, and Neil, gives you signals on your CV that you're able to engage with stuff or sustain it. Um, but I think the other thing that we're really finding at Arambi is that conversational English in South Africa is really, really important for young people. So we found that they go to school, they learn a level of English, the world of work operates in English, then they're pushed into unemployment, then they speak vernacular for two or three years, and then when they come and find their way to Harambi, when they have to go to an employer or to be interviewed or write a CV, what an employer does is says, oh, well, the CV is so badly constructed, I'm not going to interview this person. Or when they speak to them in English, the, the young person finds it really hard to converse and portray their own abilities in English. Um, so at Harambi, we've developed some step-up programs to try and help young people engage with conversational English and numeracy and to not lose some of those skills while they're unemployed. So my, my advice to young people would be to try and find any volunteering, any volunteering experience, experience, create them if you need, create to, them if you need to, 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 engage in your community. In your community. Um, um, you know, even if it means in, joining a public works program, for example, um, and then also to work on English to work and, to work and, work and to continue and learning. To learn. and to whether it's even through your own library or whatever, whatever learning is available to you. I think you've just brought a very interesting point here in terms of what is valued um, in the work sphere versus people's actual lived um, experiences. And it's a pity that, of course, um, there's this language issue. I mean, coming back to you, Zama, is, is there a sense that, you know, the economy and the opportunity that it's created is not necessarily um, geared towards um, the expectations and the experiences of young people, and how do you bring the two closer together, especially when it comes to issues such as language um, and um, and foster cultural things like being able to interact with an employer? Um, yeah, there, there is there are differences again because we we, we live in such different spaces. Um, Many young people only really um, come to contact with people of different cultures, um, uh, different socioeconomic um, backgrounds when they get to, 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 to the workplace. And because they may not have um, a parent who works, they may not be aware of that kind of, you know, there's this, there's a kind of, um, how do I put it, a, a fluidity in, in our behavior when we move between spaces. And we are, often we get the cues of that, of that fluidity from our parents in terms of workplace. I know when I started my first job, my mother sat me down, she gave me a book, she told me I must never be late, she, she, she told me I always have to have a notebook. But I, have, I had that support from day one. Um, a lot of young people don't have that um, support. They don't have that kind of understanding of, of, of those cultural cues and, and they have to, to learn in the workplace and they are severely punished. Um, workplaces are simply, I, I feel workplaces in South Africa need to do a lot more in understanding the, the country where they are, where they, they're working and, 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 and to accommodate that and to make sure that there is a day before day one where young people are brought in and they're given a, a, a kind of clear idea of expectations. That doesn't happen enough in, 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 in many work, uh, workplaces. Um, but it is, it is a, a function of, of our society, and we must never discount what, what the word structure means in, 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 in our society and how it actually um, manifests itself in the experiences of young people. Because this is where we're failing as a nation, really, to, 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 to understand the severity of our problems and to understand just how much of a step up we need to take in order to address those problems. We can't expect to be doing the same as a country in Europe for its young people when our country carries the, the burden that it carries. Very eloquent.